professor of ethics of water engineering at the Department of Ethics and Philosophy of Technology, um, and also the director of uh, the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management at uh, TU Delft. Very glad to have you with us today, Nelke. Okay, so <laughs> I have to find my uh, uh, thing to unmute myself. Um, I'm going to open my other laptop so that I can see the chat as well. Um, I think two mouses here, which is also a little bit confusing. Uh, let me see. So yes, now I'm all settled. Um, so thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I will remove this because you will probably, yeah. My name is uh, Nilke, Nilke Dorn, and uh, I work at Delft University of Technology. Um, I have a background in civil engineering and in philosophy. And um, yeah, that's, um, it's not a very common combination, I must say. Uh, civil engineers are known to be very kind of down to earth, uh, looking at things in a very concrete way. Um, concrete in, in both senses of the word, I would say. Um, and philosophers, of course, are sometimes thinking more abstract levels. And that's, uh, can, sometimes that's, that's interesting. When I'm among philosophers, I, so, I sometimes really feel like an engineer and I feel like, please make it a little bit more concrete. And if I'm among engineers, I feel like, whoa, 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 wait, let's look at it at a more abstract level. Um, so let's see which hat I put on here in this presentation. Now, first a question to you. So the, the session is about responsible engineering and could you name some characteristics of, of an engineer? What makes an engineer? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and say it. No one dares to give an answer. Oh, I, I can give two answers based on my experience as an engineer. I think engineers are very solution oriented and they like to optimize things. Um, and of course, often that's that's a good good that's that's useful, that's helpful, but it also comes with some pitfalls. And uh, what I will do here, I will first give you two historical, well, cases, is it cases, examples of where these, this optimization, this solution-oriented attitude of engineers, um, how that led to some undesirable consequences. And then I will move to water and discuss well, what's characteristic of water. Uh, and for me, one of the things is that there are different values attached to, to water, also different functions. Then I will end my presentations um, with three approaches to dealing with this. You can call it value pluralism. Um, and I see that there's now more in the chat. Curious process. Um, I, I saw it too late. Sorry for designing safe and innovative projects that advance humanity. That's that. that that's good. That I, I do like those um, those characteristics as well. And I, I recognize it. Um, um, yes. No. I, mean, I and I, actually, I must say that I see that engineers nowadays are actually more idealistic than they were in my time. I, when I I studied in the nineties, and I felt that there was a lot of engineering for the sake of engineering, and. Um, the students I teach nowadays are much more about um, motivated by really making the world a better place and really helping, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, humans uh, and, and also their, their environmental awareness. So yes, thanks for the answers. Um, okay. Um, this is a movie, uh, please don't watch it now, but I've included the QR code. 
it's a, it's a beautiful animated movie. It's from a project that says end poverty. And they give the example of um, the mosquito bug in um, uh, the, the malaria mosquito, sorry, in uh, Egypt in 1942. It led to a lot of malaria and then the experts were brought in. Well, they invented something, namely uh, pesticides. So they used all kinds of chemical ways to beat the malaria mosquito. And in a way, it was helpful. The malaria mosquito disappeared. But unfortunately, it came with a lot of pollutions, pollution. And the people didn't actually realize that um, all their previous interventions, the way they uh, developed agriculture, the way they uh, put dams in the river now, that that was actually the thing that contributed to the growth of, or the, the increase of all those um, the mosquitoes. So it's a very nice movie, which encourages people to not to go for quick solutions, but really look at the problem that's behind something. So please, uh, after this, this session, take a look at this. It's a very, very inspiring movie. Another example, this is from the Netherlands. Um, and actually, I, I, this, this graph is from the Netherlands, but it's something that happens everywhere. And that's land subsidence. In the Netherlands, in the year about around uh, thousand, we we began uh, making ditches on our land so that the water could could be drained away, so that our land became livable and manageable. But unfortunately, we got stuck into some spiral in which we had to drain even more and had to kind of construct dikes, uh, pumping and all that. And nowadays, nowadays still our land is sinking. So at some point the water is too high. So we, we, we lower the, 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 the water level so, and then the land sinks even more. And this is also something where it was Around the year thousand, it, it, it looked so kind of so good to just to to uh, build the dikes and to have those ditches so that we have this manageable land. But it was really optimized for one thing. Well, um, if you look at at actually the land subsidence in the Netherlands, you can see it's about maybe five six meters. Um, this is quite well known picture from the U.S. And, and if you look at the numbers, it's here even. Worse, it's about, well, let me guess, 10, 10 meters or so, only between 25 and 1977. And here it was primarily due to a lot of um, uh, water pumping for agriculture. So you see that water was, uh, water was pumped uh, just for one purpose, agriculture, and that leads to some undesirable situation. And, well, uh, Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, is also a very um, well, well known example of a city that, that suffers from uh, land subsidence. And they're now even considering moving the capital to somewhere uh, or making some other city the capital because Jakarta is simply uh, almost lost, people say. So that's, that's kind of the pitfall of being very solution oriented and really kind of trying to optimize for one thing. And let me, let me now use, uh, move to water specifically. What's characteristic of, for water? And this is it's actually the, um, the cover of uh, a report um, in, in the Netherlands. It's the, the, the yearly report of the which the, 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 the government needs to report on how the, our surface waters are doing uh, for in, in terms of the European Water Framework Directive. That's a legal directive that, that's intended to improve the water quality. And um, well, unfortunately, the heading is in, uh, in Dutch. It says that many of the safety measures, the water safety measure, flood safety measures that are taken are detrimental for water quality. And you must know in the Netherlands, the Netherlands is a country, a very low lying country. So when we think about our water system, 
if we are naive, and we often are, we only we tend to think about flood safety only. So we take a lot of measures. All our, our water system is currently really optimized for providing flood safety. But well, with three very dry, uh, very hot summers in a row, we now know that the Netherlands, we can also be confronted with drought and water quality is also quite an issue in the Netherlands. Our surface waters are of poor quality. And actually, I really like the cover of, of this report because you really see all the different values or different uses attached to water. I mean, we need it for sanitation, we need it for recreation, drinking water, mobility, the environment needs good water, industry, health, um, agriculture. And if we, if we talk about water, about our water system, we somehow need to um, include all those values. We need to think about how to, um, how to make sure that, that all the uses all the, and all the different values are acknowledged. Um, yeah, so why, what I will do now is, so we, we are confronted with, with the situation of value pluralism, I call it, or call it user pluralism. And what I will do, I will present three approaches for dealing with, with this value pluralism. And the first one, and it sounds very, very obvious, but still it is, um, it's for within the engineering world, not so obvious, I must say, but really take different uh, functions into account when making something. As I said, in the Netherlands, our, our system used to be, our water system used to be designed for prevention of flooding only. And there are a lot of measures taken in the Netherlands to prevent flooding, where the most that was done was to reduce the negative impact on the environment. Now, if you think about value pluralism, what you should actually do is try to make something that is good for several values, or is good, fulfills several functions. So not just one optimizing for one and well, doing the other, trying to reduce the negative impact of the others, but make something that's good for the environment and for flood safety. And this is, this is the sand motor. It's an artificial sand bank near the coast of the Hague. Um, and it provides protections, protection from, uh, from the sea. But it's also good for the environment. And actually, there are quite some new species that have found that uh, space. So um, a lot of birds. Um, it also provides a recreational area, but especially in terms of uh, uh, making space for, for um, for birds, it, it scores uh, quite well. So that's one way of dealing with, with, with this kind of different values. Mm. Another one, um, and that's more related to policy. As engineers, we're often um, asked to inform policy. And um, here it is important not to work with black box models where there's just one, num one number that comes out and try to optimize that number. No, try to work with models where you can make uh, different values explicit or use methods that where you can kind, um, uh, include scores on, on different criteria and without um, immediately aggregating it into one number. So you uh, some structure the, the your, uh, your, your problem in such a way that you can, for example, apply thresholds on different criteria. It's quite a technical story here, but a lot of people think, well, when I'm modeling, that's kind of neutral objective things. But also in your modeling, you can, there are a lot of value-laden choices and make, make these explicit. And lastly, and um, I think I forgot to mention that these three approaches, they should really not be seen as mutually exclusive. You need all of them. And especially this last one is an important one. This is an example in the Netherlands, um, actually from, a from the city where I live, in Nijmegen. And um, this was a, quite a new way of uh, dealing with 
high river discharge. So there was this, this area, which you see in the right picture, uh, that was actually reserved for high uh, river discharges. So if there's a high water, uh, um, water can flow there. And it's a whole project called Room for the River. Um, it's actually also an example where you see that there was some engineering solutions where they, um, which was, which scores well both on, uh, on, on environment and on providing flood safety. But I included this picture uh, also to show that a lot of intervention in the water world have a very spa a, a huge spatial impact. And if we're talking about spatial impact, it means that often, um, well, a limited number of people is uh, impacted or have to bear the burdens for the greater good. So there are a lot of, um, individual versus collective trade-offs. So for that reason, and this actually, this is a picture of uh, a, a, a place which is 50, 50, 100 kilo, or 100 kilo, kilometers downstream from the city of Nijmegen. And there people said, like, we don't want this widening of the river because we, we live here. We, 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 um, it comes at the expense of our houses. So the third way for dealing with value conflicts is really include the local stakeholders. So don't impose, don't think from your engineering desk what the best solution is, but have very um, careful procedures. Ask the stakeholders with what they found, uh, what they find important. So that, that also links to the previous uh, discussion. Involving working with uh, the, the public with communities is not, it's not something kind of subjective and, and, um, and they're not, not the experts. No, their values matter. And it's, it's very important um, as an engineer, if you, if you make interventions in space to include those people and not just to include them because you're using their land, but also because they often have very valuable information to give. So with that, I would like to open a discussion. It's a very brief introduction on, uh, on water ethics or maybe ethics of water engineering. It, it focused quite a bit on, uh, on the engineering part. And I'm looking forward to uh, discussing this with you. Thank you, Nunca, for your presentation, and um, I take over uh, your invitation <laughs> to have questions. Um, uh, so please uh, feel welcome to raise your hand. Jana? Is... Hi, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I, I was really interested in, you know, the, I mean, all of the, the three, you know, steps or recommendations that you had, and I was wondering if, you know, what, um, your thinking is or experiences have been with, um, you know, the first one you were talking about making innovation that is good for multiple different values, not just one. Um, and, and I was wondering if you have experience going through that process of identifying multiple different values, like what does that look like? And how does one, you know, organize it? And, how, you know, how, you know, what's the process of getting there to even know what the different values might be? Yeah, well, actually, it's um, there's there's one where I have to I, um, that immediately um, pops up in my mind, and it was actually a discussion that I had with um, with uh, people working at the water board, at the water authority, so really the technical experts, and somehow at some point that discussion switched from a discussion with experts to a discussion um, with people. So they put on their hat of citizen and they talked, it was about, um, it was actually a discussion about what to do with, with uh, pharmaceutical residues in the inner water system, which is something that people are struggling with. And it, it, was, it was so interesting to, to see someone taking the position of, yeah, but if I think about my mom and she should be able to have the good medicines and others were like, yeah, but I have a kid and I want to have my kid to have um, a healthy surface water system in, in when she's old. So I think 
it 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 really helps if we off, ask people to to <laughs> to be humans, you know, <laughs> to 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 put on, put on a different maybe a different role or so. Um, so that, that that was my the the yeah that was a very inspiring experience actually. But it's not um, I'm I'm of course not sure whether that dynamics always happens in in every session, but. I think it is something that's worth uh, stressing to people. Like you're also a person. You're also you're more more than just the water authority. You're more than just the engineer. Okay, um, Other uh, questions? I would again, you know, have a question in a similar spirit, uh, knowing of, of the innovative uh, work that you're doing in developing uh, pedagogical methods and for example, the role play about the big transport in uh, Netherlands was such a case where I also saw the focus on policy and on changing structures and not uh, only responding on the moment to a situation. So I would be very curious to hear more about uh, the ways in which you integrate these uh, concerns and this uh, presentation of value pluralism in uh, your teaching, either you or your colleagues at uh, TU Delft. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, in a way, it helps that I'm an engineer. And I think um, I when I when I teach engineering ethics to students, uh, they often feel like, oh, now we have this mandatory course on ethics, and they kind of they're, they 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 want to go there. So I I, I mostly I start with um, an anecdote from I worked ten years as an as an engineer, and I come with an anecdote, and that's kind of the icebreaker, and then uh, working along cases also cases that are seemingly kind of what well, there's nothing wrong here and then i try to um uh, encourage them to think a little bit harder and to and to to find things where i feel like okay well this could have been done differently and then yeah i think that there's all of course also a lot of other pedagogical things but that 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 are important for for, for teaching in general is providing a safe space, uh, allowing them to make mistakes. Uh, and even if they come with, a, with the most technocratic solution still, that, that where I feel like, well, oh, is this really desirable? Still um, having a discussion and not, not kind of um, uh, accusing them of, of, of acting wrongly or so. So I think in that sense, teaching is, is always about providing a safe space and then my experience is that actually most students are interested and in, yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, so uh, speak now, <laughs> or uh, we can also maybe have uh, five more minutes uh, towards uh, the end of um, today's presentation. So, um, I think Ben is, or is it a hand or not? I, uh, sorry, I don't see that where the participants. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> it is my own mouse that makes a hand if it's on. <laughs> sorry. Oh. <laughs> I feel that I'm really kind of presenting myself here as the most clumsy uh, um, Zoom presenter. And I must say that in the last year we've used a different platform more often. But uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> it's all recorded. <laughs> No, we're all in a way <laughs> trying to get used with this. So now uh, we're moving to Canada and we have Raphael Ziller with us, who is a professor at HEC Montreal. In uh, 2004, he co-founded the social, social ecological research group Get Things Done Sustainably. And uh, Raphael's focus is on social innovation in relation to water, justice and sustainability. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you for the invitation. One moment, I'm going to try to um, do this properly. Does it work with the screen? Yes. Does it, does it work, the screen? Uh, yes, it works. Yes, it does. 
Okay, thank you very much. So thanks again for the invitation. Um, of course, I'm joining your group with some trepidation because I'm not an engineer um, and I'm not working in, in, um, in a polytechnic or something like this. <clears throat> the HSC is a, is a business school, Ecole de Commerce. Um, but Jana said anyway, um, it could be interesting to contribute something. But so this just being said, um, I had the pleasure in the past to work on some topics of water ethics, for example, with my colleague um, David Grunfeld, um, who is really trying to advance this field of water ethics. And in this book here, The Global Water Ethics, we try to, um, um, <clears throat> you know, say that water ethics, as we heard before from the speakers, is something very complex with multiple values. Um, <clears throat> And it has these two aspects on the one hand of studying practical reasoning um, in relation to water um, as a descriptive part, what do engineers and other people really do? But of course, also always as a question of um, critique and justification. So what are the reasons that people give um, for what they do and what might also be alternatives? So I think there is this normative part to, to water ethics that takes us more to, to, to philosophy and also to the divisions um, of different um, stakeholders, as Jana um, had um, said in her presentation, that is this very important and um, not always easy to deal with. Um, and at the same time, this topic of the water alternatives or sustainability alternatives more generally is obviously, I think, a really important topic since we all know we urgently need um, transformation in direction of sustainability and so far it's not happening or not happening fast enough. So there's a lot of work to do. <clears throat> and talking with Diana, um, what I'd like to share with you today is um, um, an approach that we use in our um, um, HSC school. We have a master's in management and sustainability um, where I'm teaching a course. Um, which um, has some aspects that might, are, might be maybe interesting for, for our discussion. Um, and also, actually, we have co-taught this course sometimes with the Polytechnic. This is the, the engineering school next to, to our business school. So there's often engineering students also in it. So that's maybe a, a further link. Um, and so Utopia dyna dynamizes action. Action dynamizes Utopia. Um, this title comes from in the course, um, um, when I started this course in 2019, we started in collaboration with the Montreal um, Museum of the Environment, which had just created an interesting um, expo called Montreal 2067, um, 2067 um, inviting um, different architects, landscape um, planners, urban planners, engineers to come up with um, visions, infrastructure visions for Montreal in 2067. The background here is that in 1967 there was a, um, a world expo in Montreal that was important for the history of the city. So they said now we're going to make a visionary expo for Montreal in 2067, inviting different people to come up with utopias for Montreal. So no budget constraints, just thinking what could be great ideas with the idea as the coordinator of the museum said, you know, utopia dynamizes actions. We need some, some sort of visions and what you see on this graph. Here is um, a picture. Um, Montreal has various big highways that go directly through the city. So they, will, they were built in the um, time of high uh, modernism when, you know, this was just built after the war fast and quick. Um, and they are now generally considered as kind of scars um, separating neighborhoods. And of course, it's not pleasant to live directly next to them as some of them are also elevated. So one project here is the Metropoline 40 is a um, um, proposal of a horticulturalist together with architects to put the highway underground and create space for a gigantic um, urban agriculture projects that also has lots of opportunities for water intention and more green space. So this just to um, give you a feel um, for the kind of visions that we're talking about here. Um, and our idea in the course is that when we talk about, you know, ethics, water ethics and sustainability more general as an important topic for education for sustainable development, um, we need to produce um, learner-centered approaches so the students have an active role. 
action oriented approaches so really linking them to different challenges um, that are not just simulated or made up but that are coming um, from from the context as here in montreal and that help with the transformation of worldviews ideally um, and as you probably know unesco has prepared this kind of um, um set of core competencies that could be fostered in such teaching contexts um, system thinking anticipation normative competency strategic competency collaboration critical thinking self-awareness and integrated problem solving <clears throat> so these are partly interrelated of course but we think they're interesting as something if if you think about a course what are the kind of learning objectives and in this course we're particularly interested in the aspect of anticipation and normative competency <clears throat> as as a question how um can you can you do um course teaching in that way um and there is something here um, to do that, which is maybe not so different from an um, engineering education, I expect. I, I suspect that on the one hand, there is a lot of um, attention now in management schools that will have their sustainability strategies and want to have more teaching on the topic. There is also a long tradition of service learning that is working with communities <clears throat> and trying to do um, maybe just like the engineers, applied and problem oriented work. <clears throat> Very often, this is however done as a case study approach so relatively particularistic. Um, and there is, the literature shows clearly, the, of course, the big challenge that sustainability in business schools tends to presuppose capitalism and often to be fairly individualistic and opportunistic. So it being unclear if this is sufficiently radical or structural enough to really do the kind of transformation of systems of production and consumption that we know are needed from such international assessments as the IPES Global Biodiversity Assessment. Um, and so for this course, <clears throat> my idea said, so what can we do in a, um, in a, a management and, and sustainability course? Um, we want to do problem-based service learning. Um, how do we do that for the course? Um, there's always mandates and these mandates are created with, um, with partners from the community. So this could be um, NGOs, it could be networks, it can be sometimes also social enterprises. They come up with topics that they find um, interesting, such as, for example, this Highway um, 40. Um, and so we think of them as social innovators. There's maybe a discussion here to be had, um, Vidyana, about the hero image. As you maybe know in, in, the, in the business um, schools, the, the hero is the, the, the entrepreneur, the business entrepreneur. Elon Musk, etc. So the social innovator is trying to move away from that. Is it sufficient? I don't know. But so basically different types of people who come up with important, um, we believe, um, um, challenges of what could be alternatives here in the, in the Montreal context. And then really the key part for the learning is we try to develop a structured approach, how to work on these visions. Um, using backcasting as a tool, and that is maybe also an important link to engineering, where this is maybe more used than in, 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 in management. In management, I think it's relatively rare. Um, we use here a specific tool developed for system innovation from the Climate Kick Future Radar to try to say if you have um, um, visions for the future and alternatives for the future, what is a structured way to think from the future back to the present? which is a full set of alternatives. And when you have made this, um, um, you know, this analysis, how can you then back develop transition pathways or strategies to move from the present into, um, um, into that future <clears throat> to develop um, desirable futures? <clears throat> and so um, what I'd like to share with you is are some results from an evaluative case study of how this works and how this um, um, helps um, students in developing these sustainability competen competencies, especially in relation to anticipation and collaboration, <clears throat> which we feel are the two important ones, at least in our context. Mm. And just to, in terms of the, again, of, I think I said that already. So this is for students from in, in the master and diploma um, degrees at HST Montreal. However, it's also open to engineers from Polytechnic. And we have always also some students from the Université de Montréal that come more from, from health um, studies. That's kind of the, the participants in this course. 
Um, and we are also, that's very important for the education part. Um, we do benefit from the aspect that our university has a strategic mission where sustainability is now part of the, um, um, the, you know, the general thinking. Um, and there's a sustainable development office that we're interacting with quite a bit um, to um, organize this course in a way that it also links um, better to what's happening on campus. I can explain that in, in, in a concrete example in a moment. And now specifically in the course, we want to develop a reflexive practice on management, foster environmental literacy, and especially foster a collaborative mindset um, with different stakeholders. If you have such ambitious visions, how do you actually collaborate um, and develop a professional practice in such projects? <clears throat> And so for this environmental literacy part, you kind of think of the, the, the course as one where the students work in groups of usually about five students, four to six. Um, we tried with seven, that doesn't work very well. So usually it's four to six. Um, and the students work in, in, in groups of four to six. And at the same time, it's accompanied with some more, you know, old fashioned style lectures on big topics, biodiversity, climate change to foster just the, the environmental literacy of the, the students and another important side aspect before we even start with the group work we do some um, reflexive exercises where the participants have to reflect on some aspects of their everyday life and how it's linked to ethics and management um, i can say more about this later if it's interesting <clears throat> but I, what i want to really focus on here is this backcasting approach where basically in the first phase at the beginning of the course the students can choose from eight to 10 mandates developed with the um, um, practitioners before the, before the um, class starts. Um, and they get three choices. So that's really important. They don't, they get, don't get imposed a mandate. They can choose um, up to three. And then we try to make groups, maximizing the preferences of everyone. And then in the main phase, phase of, this, um, of this work, um, we start by um, saying, OK, if these are the visions, what is what are really the values and principles um, that um, underpin these visions as i'm sure you all know that's often easier said um, than actually done when you when you look into water alternatives um, there can be different values different principles it's really not easy and in the course accompanying this exercise we draw on the um, um, we introduce um, values typology the different types of values instrumental intrinsic trans, um, relational um, transformative in environmental ethics, and we draw on the capabilities approach um, from um, human development and justice research to have a really rich set of multiple goods and, and values that are linked um, um, to human well-being in such projects. So the students have to work on this value analysis to get a good grip on why this could be desirable, and they also have to do in the beginning, a stakeholder analysis to ask if there is this vision, who are actually the different stakeholders who are affected or who might, or who might affect um, 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 and the, the, the vision or the transition towards it. And there we use different attributes such as power. So that again is linked to a point that Jana mentioned, who has really power in, in, in such constellations, but also who has legitimacy as there might be groups who have not much power, but they have high legitimacy to be considered, and also urgency. So this is a stakeholder framework um, for management from Mitchell um, to get a sense of who are the different types of stakeholders, dangerous, dormant, um, definite stakeholders. So there's different types here to get a good sense for that. Um, and also think about how this links to these values of that um, desirable future um, that the mandate proposes. <clears throat> and based on that, preliminary work, the students prepare transition pathways that is essentially ideas of how you can unfold um, um, that vision within its, in its, in, in its time constraint. And once they have done that with this tool of the, of the um, future rater, they have to again, again go back um, and use something called the ethics canvas that's from the University of Dublin. Um, to do an exercise um, of anticipation of what they propose, what might be the unintended consequences of, of their proposed action. To really um, think about that and also already include in their proposal potential remedial actions to anticipate these consequences. 
And then in the last part, they um, present these results to the, you know, to the partners of the mandates and then submit um, a final report as a, as a result of the, of the coursework. Um, and so here you see just as some examples from the, so from the evaluative case study that we did, the mandates in that year were um, Grand Splash, that's, that's basically an initiative of the, um, the River Foundation in Quebec that tries to create more um, access to um, urban rivers and swimming spots. Another one related to water is Ruelle Bleu Vert, that is the creation of blue-green black lanes, how you can, so we have um, a very popular concept of green back lanes in Montreal, but they do not include rainwater management. So this alliance of the Ruelle Bleu Vert is trying to advance this topic. The highway already talked about, the Communauté Bleu, you maybe know from the work of Maud Barlow, Blue Communities, how you can include um, the human right to water in the, in the management of um, municip water management of municipalities. And these two are linked to what I said, that it's important for us to have this link to the university. Um, Ecter Urbaine is an urban agricultural permaculture initiative on campus, and so is the carbon neutrality. So these were the kind of mandates the students worked on in the, in the fall of 2020. And so now um, at the end of the course, we do a learning assessment um, to see um, what they think they learned from it. And so reading these, um, what were the outcomes? It was um, really important for them um, to do this kind of the, the, the group work with mandates to apply and contextualize often abstract as the as you know sustainable development topics i'm thinking of the sdg that everyone talking is talking about but it often remain really kind of vague right what you're doing with this so having more a, a place-based sustainability learning came very strongly out in the in the assessments um, but also better understand sustainable development projects and their actors i think that is um, maybe interesting again to this topic of the um, um hero and the innovator because I think at least in that approach, the innovator is not so much a hero, it's actually more helping the students to demystify a bit. If you have a visionary who comes from a community or wants to put something that these are normal people, they face all kinds of troubles. So our experience there was more that this was both inspiring and also giving a more correct picture what these processes actually are. Maybe notably also because we try to really link this to the collaboration and emphasize that nothing happens if you do not create um, networks to advance your cause. Um, and the other really important part was that the students said it was very important for them not to just have another um, simulation or um, you know, invented problem, but to work on real problems. That was a real source for them. Um, this second part I already mentioned. For the anticipation, as a competency to, uh, to understand desirable and evaluate multiple futures, possible, probable. Um, the, the, the backcasting tool Future Radar was very much um, popular um, by the students and a lot of them also said they're gonna use it in their, we have a lot of students who work at the same time that they actually can make use of this in their own professional practice and some even for their personal lifestyles. And the other one that was very helpful again for I think dealing with um, um, value pluralism and linking it to different stakeholders was the ethics canvas um, to um, explore and consequences of ideas. And what we also thought was really interesting in the, in the learning assessments is how strongly the students emphasized the utility of such tools to really do um, um, group work. Um, it, they said it, it was maybe partly of the COVID effect, right? It was not easy to do the online teaching in 2020. Um, but they said the group work and the structured group work was really something that they were looking forward to in their, um, in their um, university experience. And that takes me to the second competency that we were focusing on, the collaboration, that is abilities to learn from others, <clears throat> to understand and respect the needs, perspective and actions of others where I think notably the stakeholder analysis and the value analysis really allow um, to get some sensitivity um, for that topic. And because it's then done via the backcasting that they have to you know, take perspectives as well. They um, saw how different their perspectives in a group of five already are and how difficult it is to also communicate that effectively these, these issues. 
Um, <clears throat> And another important learning is, of course, that it's really not important to do, not easy um, to do such group dynamics and effective group work. Um, um, where again, um, I think working on a real mandate, um, it's both very challenging, but also very helpful because they see that these challenges are not made up. They're just part of, of such um, complex structural change um, attempts. <clears throat> So to sum up, for the um, water ethics part, um, I would like to suggest that um, this backcasting approach can be quite interesting to um, think about um, integrating desirable futures in a methodological way. Um, and that it's also quite helpful for really, in practice, um, foster sensitivity for diversity of stakeholders, their values and interests, and as well how this is linked to time scales, right? Because the backcasting is very helpful to make you think about what are the different sequences and possibilities in that. And that's, that's I think, quite linked to these parts um, how values might change and or how they might articulate them. <clears throat> we are quite ten, um, confident so far that um, this approach contributes to anticipation and ethics in our, our class. There is also quite some tensions, of course. One is the real life dynamic of real mandates um, where projects evolve in real time and not all students are happy with that. If you know we announce one thing and then there's some changes or extra events that does not go well with all students. And of course, we also face this issue that structural change happens over time, but a, a term is a term, so it's very short. So there's this issue of the projectitis which um, one thing that we're now trying to work on is how we can foster more long-term relations with some of these mandates so that, um, that they can evolve across different courses, which is again, a very nice feature because now we can start to invite students from past courses to share their work. And so there is this kind of peer learning also in, in that way. From the teacher's perspective, it is definitely a lot of fun to work with um, um, these different um, um, participants. And I would fully confirm this point about uh, um, in sustainability science, it's sometimes called extended peer review, you know, the, the knowledge that comes not only from academics, but maybe um, um, as tacit knowledge or practical knowledge that comes from, from partners. It's, it's very in, in, inspiring and important. It helped us uh, establish, link our course much better into in the direction of the school but it also requires a lot of work. That's for sure, especially in the preparation of the work. And then I would say the link to research is not always very clear. And <clears throat> so that's that. And so to end in a dialectical note, Utop Utopia dynamiz dynamizes action, our muse museum partner said, but action also um, dynamizes Utopia. And so we feel with this approach, there's also some slow changes are really happening. So to come back to this um, highway example, um, based on that, actually, we have now an alliance for the innovation of infrastructures, urban infrastructures and mobility that has fostered, that brings to, um, together um, students who in the, worked in the first cohort of this um, with um, professors from our business school, but also from engineering, mobility research at Polytechnique. Um, new materials use um, from Concordia University and management of big projects at, at UCAM University. So there is kind of um, um, a network emerging from this and we have, for this network has submitted its first, um, um, you know, recommendation for the Montreal and um, for the Quebec Ministry of Transport um, um, a couple of weeks ago, because that ministry wants to remake this highway exactly as it is above the earth big concrete structure. So we made recommendations what could be in the short-term options here, but also what might be more visionary long-term options. <clears throat> so that's that. Um, Thank you, well, I understood, is the Dutch version. Um, and here a little publicity for a book where I'm trying to um, explore a little bit more these ideas to ethics and innovation that is in the background of that thinking. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Raphael. And it was great to hear about how you are teaching sustainability. And even if you said, okay, it is a business environment, I think uh, the concerns and challenges are common to both uh, that engineering education tries to, to tackle and uh, similar learning uh, outcomes. 
Uh, I invite now uh, our audience to ask um, any questions or make uh, any comments or even share their own uh, experience uh, if they have been um, uh, teaching um, this, uh, this topic. Please feel welcome to, to raise your hand and uh, let's say in the meantime, until you are uh, articulating a question you might have, uh, um, I, I have a curiosity regarding your approach as here at U Eindhoven, we are also experimenting with uh, what we call challenge-based learning. So instead of mandates, we have challenges of involving uh, real life cases brought by um, uh, local startups or companies or even uh, um, student uh, entrepreneurship teams and uh, one problem uh, so we we found that indeed students are very excited about this and uh, they get a broader understanding of ethics but at the same time it's quite hard to scale up this approach so if you have a large uh, class um, this requires a lot of contact and a lot of support on the part of the teacher so mm -hmm. it requires a lot uh, many many um, uh, many moments of interaction between students and external with external uh, people who are bringing the mandate or the challenge uh, um, a different type of guidance from the teacher and i'm curious how you have managed this aspect of uh, um, of the time commitments required by uh, bringing in uh, real challenges and uh, of how to deal with a large class so i don't know exactly how many students uh, are involved yeah, so in your I'm, initiative yeah yeah, that's a really good point. So in our um, 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 university, basically the, the classes have a maximum size of 45 students. Mm -hmm. And then, so this course is then taught in different subunits, you know, so for example, this fall we have three subunits of each maximally um, about 40 students um, with one teacher per, per subunits. And within the subunit, you then break it down into um, in groups of, uh, of five. Um, and as, as I, I think I mentioned already in the preparation, this definitely takes some time. So in the summer, you know, some scoping, what might be interesting things that are happening right now and organizations that are also interested have some pre-discussions. Um, why does my, you know, to, to find out some um, organizations that, that might find it interesting for them as well and are willing to, to commit some accompaniment. We don't have money for that, you know, it's not mm -hmm. a paid service or anything like this. In the medium term, we hope that we will also get some more structural support because there's mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of talk that there has to be more experiential learning. But at the moment, all this money seems to go to the MBA. So the big money, whereas the Master in Sustainability, it's more, um, you know, we have to do it, but there's no extra support. So we think some things could change there, notably because it's popular. There's a lot of students, so um, this could be um, better supported. At the same time, I should emphasize that at our university, the um, teaching is we are given quite some time for the teaching. So it's, mm -hmm. it's also we, we do have the time. Um, so it's not I don't want to say it's bad, but mm -hmm. I, I think if you want to do serious experiential learning, and I think I've seen this. Um, so when I when I prepared this backcasting, I, I do think the only um, people who really do backcasting and teaching are really engineers, from what I could find in articles. Mm -hmm. And there was one case, I believe it was at Lund University, and they really have a center with staff who is who is accompanying this this every year. That's of course the ideal solution <laughs> if you have that kind of support, right? And they, the way they do it, if I remember that properly, is that students from all the courses, they can apply to take that class, right? So it's not even linked to specific masters, if I understood it properly, but you can say, okay, I want to do this as part of my um, degree. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and Wes, I would be curious to continue this conversation as uh, there is this similar, um, let's say, a vision as to the role of experiential learning in making students aware of their societal responsibilities and um, also the environmental uh, challenges at stake, but I also want to give opportunity to other people in the audience to comment or to ask uh, questions. I have a quick question. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank, you. thank you for your presentation. I, you mentioned in, um, you know, your, your talk about I think at some point you mentioned something about structural change and bringing structural change through these mm -hmm. projects. And 
I was wondering if you could um, give us, you know, an example or two about, you know, what, what that looks like, or are there projects where you feel that these, you know, the service learning has achieved structural change and what did it look like? Yeah, so um, what I wanted to say by that is that, you know, if you talk about the water alternatives, um, as for example, this highway or the project of the blue green lanes, these are infrastructure projects, right? Um, so a lot of the, the water management typically, I think, is based on what's sometimes called this old water paradigm that the rainwater um, kind of is channeled out of the city relatively fast, right? And now we try to find ways of um, how you can better manage rainwater in the city and at least slow down the flood pulse, for example, and have more water for um, all kinds of projects. And so, the, um, for, for example, for this um, blue-green, Gruel Bleu Vert, blue-green street projects, and what does structural change mean here? Um, so Montreal has a lot of these back streets historically um, that are, you know, they're kind of beh behind the houses. Um, between two streets, you have a back lane, um, which is just used for walking around or, you know, um, just a back lane basically. And this has been rediscovered by citizens as um, green lanes, you know, that are increasingly popular as for, you know, just hanging out recreation. And now the idea of this project is to say um, what's really important for climate resilient Montreal is to link this also to rainwater management and try to ensure that the water from the roofs um, of the houses does not just go in the canal, but can be retained partly via these streets to create, um, you know, different structures, in, um, um, physical structures for water retention. And think about, you know, this depends, of course, on the respective community. What do they want to do? Do they just want to have something pretty or do they want to use it for agriculture? All kinds of issues. <clears throat> and so that's a, a structural change. And at the same time, it is, a, um, um, you know, a change in norms and policies. Because in this case, for example, it requires co-responsibility between private owners and public service de l'eau who so far was the expert in charge of this, and now you have a shared responsibility. And so in practice, how does this happen? There is a two pilot projects, which the students uh, accompany, you know, they really accompany, I, I don't wanna put too much emphasis, it's, this is a very complex, right? So they, they can accompany it and that, that's really it. And we have to be really modest and humble there, it takes a long time. Um, in these pilot projects, you can kind of see the social and, you know, and technical challenges of just having a pilot and how this also needs to change, I would say culturally, how people think about the um, you know, way people work together and what are the kind of expertise. So in this, you know, in this pilot, it's, um, it's a, um, um, a collective called um, Batiment Set, which has basically um, um, occupied an abundant industrial site and they would like to have this Real Bleu Vert and now there is um, a discussion, how do, can they come to an agreement with the local administration in a way that they don't feel dominated by the administration who has the experts, but also the administration, you know, who is well-intentioned too, doesn't feel we have to do a, subscribe here to a risk that we can't really control because they are also bound by different norms, right? And the norm actually, so that's a little success, the norm has already um, has slightly changed to allow some um, places. So there has been normative change, but of course there's no practice. So there's uncertainty and this, this requires then trust how you actually exactly gonna do these kind of things, right? Before they are really scaled on a large, because the intention here is to have many of these projects all over Montreal. But for that, I think you need some pilots that can show, okay, that's how it worked. That's how they work together. And that's also the benefits, right? How much water was retained. How does can this contribute to local cooling? And so in this Real Bleu Vert, you know, we're one group of governance, a subgroup of governance. So the, the Real Bleu Vert, you have to think of, it started by an, um, an enterprise who essentially are landscape architects and urbanists. And then it's linked to an NGO for urban, urban, urban ecology, um, a center for social housing um, and the city. So they have an alliance and then it has a subgroup of research, which, it itself is subdivided into governance. That's where we are part of. Then it has a group for flora and fauna. That's the people who have expertise in vegetalization and what kind of plants you could, could use or not use. And then we have uh, hydrologists 
um, who have that kind of um, 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 competence. And very interesting, we have one group on life cycle analysis to try to um, you know, really um, calculate what would be the difference of such a project as opposed to a, um, a typical usual project that is done um, um, for water management. So that's, I don't know if that makes sense, just to illustrate a little bit how this works in practice. And that's why, you know, in, on our experience, also with the engineers, it is actually quite collaborative. It's not, it's not the hero who comes with a solution. Um, and also our partners, I must say, they are quite, from, from engineering, they are quite in mobility, they are quite interesting in, and they actually do the vulnerability studies, who are the populations and how are they affected. Um, so that's the part. And at the same time, so that's why I wanted to insist on the hero. That's kind of, I find complicated because I do feel you need community leaders, right? Or um, academic leaders and other people who are a little bit willing to take stick their heads out, even if it's a bit risky and sounds very unreasonable, like, you know, putting a highway underground, of course, you will get most mostly laughed off in most audiences. It's expensive and far-fetched from everyday life. <clears throat> um, but that's what makes it inspiring as well, right? And visionary. <clears throat> so that's, uh, it's kind of a balance how, I don't know, how do you can do that. <clears throat> Thank you for a bit detailed uh, view. And uh, I think now we are uh, going back to Europe in Ireland and we have with us uh, Edmund Byrne, who is a professor at University College Cork uh, and also the convener of the most recent conference of engineering education uh, for sustainable development, who recently issued an amendment, amendment, a work amendment to the Barcelona Declaration. And Ed also won several awards for his work as educator and I'm naming, naming um, only the iChemi uh, Frank Morton Medal for Excellence in Chemical Engineering Education. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for the introduction. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm not sure if it was, uh, uh, but certainly thank you for the uh, invitation mm -hmm. to, to today's um, seminar and, and to Sefi as well. I've been really educated uh, by a lot of people who are claiming they're not engineers and who aren't engineers, but I think you've been uh, teaching us, uh, certainly as, as somebody who is an engineer, but, but not an ethicist, uh, you know, I think it's been terrific and, and been really educational because I think we can learn an awful lot from, from, from our, our colleagues and the previous speakers. Um, I certainly can. Can you see my presentation on the screen at the moment? Yes, I confirm we can see it. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, so I, I suppose really, you know, I, I feel, um, as, as, as you mentioned, Dan, I'm Ed Byrne is my name. I'm from uh, University College Cork in, in Ireland. And, um, uh, I, you know, we, we, there's a sense of urgency, really, in terms of the transformation that, that, that's ahead of us, uh, societal transformation away from unsustainability uh, over the coming years and decades. And to me, I, you know, I, I teach fluid mechanics, so, you know, uh, and things like that, but I also tried to teach and have done for the last, say, 15 years and beyond 20 years, uh, ethics uh, as an engineer, and, and sort of floundered with that and, 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 and you know, muddled my way around and, and, and learned from people like, like uh, you, you, yourself, Diana, and, and Eddie Conlon in, in TU Dublin and others across, across the, the globe, um, and, and been very grateful for that. Um, but you know, I, I would agree that our, you know, a really key intervention point here is our graduate engineers and our curriculum, that if we want to make a difference in the world, we need to change. And our engineers are not fit for purpose. And I'd just like to thank Yana for her, her presentation because she really has shone a light uh, in, a, in a very cogent um, and concrete way on why engineers are not fit for purpose. And, 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 um, and I think that's, that's, that really can, can, can help us uh, move forward uh, in a positive way. So I, I, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, I, again, I know nothing about much about uh, water either to be, to be um, clear, um, but um, I'm going to talk about uh, some work that I published um, a decade ago now. So unlike um, Raphael, this is not backcasting, this is going backwards, and then I'll move forward. So I suppose as well, if you happen to have a device or a mobile phone or something that has, has um, uh, online capacity, uh, you might just have it at handy if you, if you can. We might just do a, a little bit of a quick um, survey just later on in the presentation. But this is based on um, some work that I, I published a decade ago, having done some work uh, in class with some uh, first year students uh, in, on the ethics side of, of, of the program. And um, 
and, and, and coming forward, this is on, on, on water provision essentially for Dublin, uh, and the capital of, of, of Ireland on the East Coast. And um, the demand obviously in many places, as with many places increasing and has been increasing, um, and the supply has been constant or, 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 or certainly not increasing. So there's been a, um, by the local authorities and so on, there's been a recognition that, that something has to change. And again, over 10 years ago, uh, it was decided ultimately to build a pipeline from the River Shannon, which is the largest river in Ireland and indeed the largest in the British Isles. And it, it flows down along the west coast of Ireland all the way to the east. So water will be taken from the Shannon to feed Dublin's uh, growing uh, um, appetite for water, let's say. And uh, so th this is due to start um, in the next couple of years and, and the cost was supposed to be 400 million and it's now 1.3 billion from a, an article in the Irish Times last year. So just to give you some context there, Dublin is over here and it's, it's, it's fed by the river Liffey and it gets most of its water from there. And the river Shannon is this long uh, river here that has a lot of, um, a lot of obviously fishing and tourism and and boating and uh, lakes and um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big um, uh, tourist potential. There's a lot of agriculture around there as well, and the idea then is to draw a, a pipeline from the the the, the lowest lake, uh, Loch Derg, uh, some 170 kilometres, uh, following some water treatment, and then bring it to the west of Dublin, uh, from which uh, inhabitants there of about a million and a half people can can uh, draw from. So that's 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 the broader picture um, as it is. So, as I say, an article from the Irish Times from last uh, from last year sort of bringing things up to date. The River Liffey provides about eighty five percent of uh, Dublin's water supply at present. That's not enough to meet future demand and risks for climate change is also causing uh, obviously drier. Um, summers particularly. The east of the country, the east of Ireland is actually very dry. It's dry in some parts of California, um, unlike the west, which is a lot wetter. So, but in the east, we have most of the population. So Dublin and Belfast are both on the east. And, and then I'm down in Cork here in, in, in the south. But, but it's mainly the population is here, whereas uh, most of the rain and the water is over here on the, on the west. So, um, uh, so the, you know, this is going to be the biggest uh, infrastructure project in over 60 years. Um, it's due to start in 2023, 24 after planning applications and so on. Um, but, you know, and that all sounds fine from an engineering perspective and all the rest, but there are a number of people, local residents and so on, and communities as we've, we've heard in other contexts who are uh, opposed to this and who don't feel that this is the right, this is the right option uh, for a number of reasons. Um, not least perhaps when the water is needed most, um, you know, in dry periods, that's when you need water in the lakes for fish and for for indeed for tourism as well um, and so on. So back in 2010 uh, when we were doing some of this work with the students um, uh, the, the um, Dublin local authority engaged some uh, expert engineering consultants uh, RPS and Veolia uh, to look at the, the issues um, and they had some scenarios for growth of, of water consumption or water demand in Dublin over time, and also then the, the, um, the supply. So the growth would, would outstrip the supply. Now we're at 2021, obviously, at the moment. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, that depending on, 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 on uh, the weather, things can be, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a quite a big demand relative to supply at given times. So they came up with a number of options. And I suppose as engineering consultants, um, you know, to every, to, to a hammer, everything is a potential nail. So to them, everything was a potential technical solution. So, you know, they had 10 options. Um, seven of them, as you can see, were basically drawing water from the River Shannon estuary. Uh, one was desalination of Irish seawater. One was taking groundwater from, from the area. And another then was taking water from another river, the River Barrow. And of those uh, 10 options, they chose uh, the seventh one, uh, the red one here, um, ultimately. So really, you know, this is a wicked problem, uh, you know, a, a complex uh, problem that, that uh, we've I suppose, mentioned uh, in different contexts uh, this afternoon or morning, wherever we are. Um, uh, so this is a problem that I gave to the students. Um, Water for Dublin um, over a 
a, a few years, a couple of years uh, around a decade ago, and asked them to look at that. And, I, you know, this is part of their ethics um, uh, uh, course or part of the course. Um, where we looked at some of the broader context. I wanted them to look at broader than just the technical and so on. Um, look at the, at the, at the, at the, the societal issues, the community issues, et cetera, and see if they could come up with, with, with some, some, um, some um, perspectives and insights into that. So what did they do? Um, and again, this is, I suppose, from the paper um, that uh, published um, thereafter in 2012 in the ISJSHE. Um, so students, you know, they, they spoke about, um, you know, one group was talking about uh, appearing to rule out water abstraction from the Shannon, first of all, on the basis of this is just a temporary solution. You know, if you have growing demand all the time, well, taking water from a river, eventually that, that demand will ultimately be outstripped. Uh, they suggest it's both unfair and unethical to take this water from, uh, you know, far away from, from local residents. And they also went on to suggest that, you know, you know, this raises the question as to what's the role of an engineer you know so engineering consultancy companies come up with solutions uh, so-called solutions that are exclusively technical and offer lots of jobs for engineers um, uh, ultimately whatever option you go for um, so they suggested you know we believe it's a broader role so all very nice things that, that they're saying this is in the in the report um, then they come along and say well okay what are the proposed actions and they suggested okay we look at, we suggest desalination of Irish seawater and also as a backup or a backstop abstraction from the Shannon. And they make no mention of demand issues that maybe could demand be perhaps reduced. Um, uh, and then one group came up with this elaborate scoring system. So I know um, Nilka suggested about black box models and aggregating, uh, you know, one number and, and to be um, cautious or very, you know, um, um, cynical of this. Um, and that's exactly what they, they, they did. Um, and uh, I suppose it's, it's the default for, for engineers um, in, in some respects. So, so it, each of the group did relate the material to professional codes of ethics as they were asked, demonstrating how the proposals complied with ethics, but really did, it's hard to see how they, how they could do more than just complying with the codes of ethics. And they were just about sort of keeping their bib clean, so to speak. So this is one of the one of the presentations. They kind of looked at things like the environmental, economic, the socioeconomic, and they put numbers on them, and they come up with that 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 one number that Nika spoke about. And they actually opted for the option which was ultimately chosen. And again, you know, it's, it's almost it's it's like any sort of cost benefit analysis or LCA or something. It's it's couched in numbers, so it's quantifiable, and hence it's 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 seen as a value, even though it's inherently subjective. Um, and sometimes that's not recognized, particularly by 18, 19 year old uh, student engineers. And then if we look at what the, 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 the consultancy company RPS uh, put together, you can see it's, well, it's actually very similar to what the students had come up with. So, you know, where are they taking their, their, their tack from? They looked at different options and they had pluses and minuses instead of uh, quantitative numbers, but it's sort of the same sort of thing. And again, you look at the technical, environmental, economic, but you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's not clear or it's, it's, it's you know, the, the community engagement perhaps um, wasn't um, necessarily there. I'd hope that the students might look at sort of contemporaneous literature at the time and we, you know, co-engineering co participatory water management processes and things like that. And of course, again, we've heard of some of that today and that has moved on since then even, but, but that generally wasn't, they didn't really engage with that. So in terms of the paper, uh, just in terms of reflections that I had at the time, I just found that, that students find the, comp the, the concepts of complex wicked problems and inherent uncertainty and transdisciplinarity far more challenging uh, than that of, of, of objective reality and the prospect of technical solutions through unique problem optimization. And maybe this is completely understandable. They've come from, you know, they're 18, 19 year olds. The, the broader uh, sphere in, in society uh, points to a certain um, way of looking at things, they've decided to become engineers, their backgrounds and contexts are, 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 are in, that, in that context. Um, and, and, and also they were looking at engineering reports which propose a technically based engineering solution to a complex problem. And of course they look at the engineering reports and say, well, you know, they're looking for the answer. Um, so surely an engineering consultant must have the right answer because they're experts. Um, this is the, 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 let's say the mindset. Um, so I suggested in the paper that perhaps maybe a more balanced approach whereby students might uh, look at broader contexts 
um, where you know water is a, a major issue already to a far greater extent than places like Dublin, um, where, where in fairness there is quite a bit of water around. Um, so maybe looking at southwestern USA, for example, or lots of other parts of the world, um, that might lead to greater student reflection, exploration, and innovation. And then I suggested that, you know, like Zadlik suggested, if the waters of the West and the West Southwest USA have been remade to serve humanity. And while these efforts brought important economic and social benefits, the upshot is that the systems we have built are unsustainable without fundamental change. And the suggestion then is, in essence, the engineering of water re uh, reservoir and transference systems as some sort of comprehensive solution to the Southwest water sustainability has really run its course. So I kind of in, 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 in future years or preceding years after that, then I, well, I did, we didn't look at the, at the water issue uh, exclusively, but we looked at wicked problems across a whole range so that students could choose various different types of wicked problems, not just water, but um, energy and, and so on. Um, but in terms of my slides, this is a slide that I would use with the students and I'd be using, I would be using it actually now, only that I, you know, I'm, I've swapped my teaching for this afternoon with um, somebody else because I can't be teaching ethics this afternoon because I'm here. But, um, you know, uh, technological innovation, in, you know, has brought us, you know, the railway lines in the 19th century. And that, that had huge social implications in terms of 1850, the US, highly populated in the East Coast. By 1900, it had moved, moved west. This idea of manifest destiny, and that was technology through the, through the, through the rails, railway lines had uh, helped, uh, you know, um, make that a reality. And I suppose that fed into this idea of teaming over the earth and subduing it. The manifest destiny of the of the European settlers, um, um, you know, as they as they overcame, um, the as as they saw it, the the wilderness that needed to be tamed, um, and and then they went to the southwest, which is arid, and of course we know that several populations over over last number of hundreds of years uh, left the place because of climate change and because of the arid situation there. They came and they dammed the Colorado River and created Lake Mead, um, so there was almost infinite amount of water there and almost infinite amount of electricity due to the Hoover Dam in the 1930s. Um, so electricity, water, and from that, you had the great technological innovation, a city in the Mojave Desert, i.e. Las Vegas. So that can be seen as a, you know, Elon Musk was mentioned before, I think he was, you know, that, that sort of a conception of reality would suggest this is a great overcoming of, of, the, of the natural um, environment that, by humankind. On the other hand, from a different perspective, maybe it's just, it's it's a it's a human folly from the from the 19th or the 20th, 20th century. Um, you know, it's how sustainable is it? Um, and you can see there the water levels in Lake Mead are falling uh, year on year. That the, the, these calcium deposits on the on the sides of the, the lake there show where the water was beforehand. And what I do is I show the students, you know, that where it's falling, and uh, we can see that the Bureau for Reclamation in the states published the the levels every month. And going back to the turn of the century, when I think it was just a last time it was full or near full, it doesn't really need to be managed out. The manage is, is, is managed decline at this stage. So the water is falling all the time. So there's a 40 meter drop over the last 20 years. I compare that with the tallest building in Cork at the moment. So students have some sort of concept how much, how much the water has fallen. And actually in the last year with the current drought in the Southwest and the USA, it's gone another five meters in just 12 months in August of this year. So, um, those concepts and I suppose the, these framings then, the, the way of looking at things, you know, what, what is the likes of Las Vegas and the Hoover Dam? Is that uh, humanity's um, overcoming of, of, of the powers of nature or is it just um, a temporary sort of um, hubris that, 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 that ultimately we have to um, realize? So different framings. And again, going back to the paper again, I mentioned that sustainability narratives are, are, are called on by both parties. And we, I think um, a previous speaker, Raphael, was mentioning about, you know, different conceptions of what, what um, sustainability might, might, might mean and might involve. Um, so, you know, RPS, Veolia, was talking about sustainable availability of a certain amount of water. And they spoke about public consultation process, which the, the people who were objecting would suggest was negligible, uh, meant that we needed long-term sustainable criteria. Um, on the other hand, People who are not objecting to the to the to the drawing of the water from the Shannon also use sustainability uh, in, in their narratives. So they suggest the question of sustainability uh, must also be examined in the wider context of a growing international awareness of how much water we consume 
and increasing concern about water shortages and conflicts between states and regions over access to ever decreasing water resources. Closely connected with the issue of the accumulating evidence that abstracting significant uh, volumes of water from river systems and lakes in various parts of the world has caused and continuing to cause widespread ecological, social, economic losses and damage. So they're quoting the World Economic Forum on Water Initiative um, that, the, the, uh, on, on that basis. So looking around there, I was saying, you know, well, really it's about framing in many respects. So I was looking at, well, maybe if we can get the students to frame or look at the, wor the world from different perspectives, um, that, that might be something that, 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 that we could try and um, facilitate their, their engagement uh, with some of these issues because ultimately they seem to just default back to the, a, certain, a certain perspective. So Annick de Witt is a, is a Dutch uh, researcher and uh, she, has, um, she has a worldviews model uh, of traditional, modern, postmodern and integrative, uh, which maybe in this context uh, will I use and I find it quite useful and, I, and the students do indeed too. So it's something I've actually um, taken up on boards and, and, and we've published some work on it. But, um, you know, in terms of the models, you know, you're talking about uh, the traditional worldview would be, you know, uh, associated with the natural cycles of, of, of nature, bound up with irreducible mystery and enchantment, and a great focus on community uh, and certainty, and then and truth was, was found through the divine order. That was superseded in many respects by the modern, which more um, separating qualitative and quantitative, techno-optimism, uh, individualistic, autonomous self, and certainty and truth then was found not by divine order, but by reductionist science. And then postmodern followed that uh, in reaction to that, a more deconstructivism, skepticism, in, 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 in eliminable uncertainty is recognized and, and perhaps a degree of relativism where there's no certainty and, and perhaps no truth um, and multiple narratives hold. And then integrative, I suppose, follows again from that then, whereby you know, it, it tries to, in some respects, take some of the best aspects of each of the other three so it incorporates irreducible complexity and wholeness and ongoing change and emergence, connectedness with the world and with others. It's just maybe there's no certainty, there's deep uncertainty, inherent uncertainty, but there is truth through both qualitative and quantitative, both through the spiritual and the physical, and through integrative emergent transdisciplinarity. So the, the way it was suggested, all of these um, worldviews, that there's none that's right or wrong, that they're just, they're certainly different, and there's none that, that all of them have, have certain value, and certainly values and value. Um, and, and, and indeed that we would all hold some aspects of, of perhaps each of them or, or some of them. Um, it's not as if we're all sort of boxed into certain, certain categories. Um, but, but it can be perhaps useful in terms of getting students, or I try to use it to get students to engage with some of these things. So what I want to do here at this stage is, as I said, mentioned before there about if you have a, a mobile phone or a, a, um, a device with you, if you could go to Slido, sli.do or slido.com, whichever you prefer, and you should see a, um, a quiz there. So there's just a, a, which of the following do you mo most closely relate to? Um, and there are four statements uh, given. So what you need to do is actually type in the event code SEFI, S-E-F-I. I don't think it matters if you have capitals or not, you should still be able to access. So if you do that, you should have four um, statements. And I just ask you to, and it's completely anonymous, you don't have to log in or anything or sign in, but it's just basically if you go to the polls and we have one person has managed to register their vote thus far. Um, so which of these four do you feel most comfortable with? That you're a citizen of the world, that you're defined by religion and upbringing, that you're, you feel part of a vast interconnected whole that is life and the universe, or defined by your social position and achievements. So what, what do you most relate to? You might relate to all of them or some of them to a certain extent, but, but which, which, which is highest. So just a, this is sort of just a, a brief snap survey and I'll show you then what our, our students have come up with and uh, how, how we've used this. Now, basically the wit has a world, she has world views test and uh, it asks about 17 of these type questions and then aggregates them. So you can just do that, it's, it's, it's online. But this is just one of the questions that's asked within that particular uh, quiz. So I see that there are um, eight people have voted at the moment. So I'll just wait another few seconds and we'll see what, um, what people might come up with. We can share this. Now, can you see the blue screen at the moment? Okay. 
we have eight votes in. So let's uh, let's just see what what people have um, have gone for. Right. So we have citizen of the world rather than citizen of the country, forty four percent, thirty three percent. Interconnected, and then eleven percent of both. So you can see we have actually all of them, all of them um, represented there. Okay. So, um, and, and that's perhaps probably what I thought might might be the the, the outcome of this, because if we look at um, okay. if we look at um, putting these. In terms of the um, in terms of the the worldview, um, sorry, the uh, apologies. Okay, so uh, I think um, I think we have about forty four percent here. 33% here, 11% here, because I'm just cohering the statements with, with each of them reflect on, 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 on one of the worldviews there. So most people have gone for the postmodern or the integrative. And I would probably suggest that that would be what one might expect from a group such as to be talking about ethics and engineering ethics in that respect. So this is what, this is what uh, I got from the students just last week when I had them last Wednesday. So actually, 39% went with the, 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 the social position and achievements. So these are like 19 year olds by and large. 21% um, with religion and upbringing. Um, so you're looking at these are the, these are the, the, the modern and the traditional. Um, so it's, 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 it's sort of the inverse of what we've just come up with. And, and then the others were, were less. So I just found that interesting. And I suppose part of it as well, we would have a, a fairly diverse, quite a diverse by Irish standards, certainly. Uh, with lots of uh, new Irish from from the African continent um, um, background, let's say, and from, from uh, Eastern Europe and Asia as well, we have some uh, students within the group. So, you know, um, so there's a fairly diverse background and so on. But I think it's useful that if we can see that people have these, you know, different perspectives, different worldviews on things, that can help uh, maybe um, understand why. Um, people have different perspectives, but also the traditional engineering way would be supposed to this one, the modern approach. If we look at that, what has that got to do with water, just to finish up that uh, with on, on that context? So I suppose if we look at water from a traditional perspective, we're really looking at um, things like, you know, for community conservation, the so conservation of, of water and taking the water from the rivers and using what we need. Um, a modern perspective might say, well, oh, well, let's use technology to actually um, if we need more water to increase the increase the uh, supply. So as demand increases, we'll just increase the supply by using our technological prowess. So we have technological ascendancy. I suppose that's where engineers really fit in. You have this supply focus, and that's where we that's kind of that 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 quadrant that we focused on traditionally and even to this day. Uh, postmodern, you know, maybe self-sufficiency. So one might be looking at um, how one could live, let's say, off-grid in many respects. Uh, look at you know grey water in one's home and so on, or maybe even you know in, maybe in a Dutch context you might be looking at you know how you can live uh, on the water at some stage in the future as sea levels rise, and then maybe an integrative uh, approach might be something along the lines of um, something along the lines of this WWF report on integrated water resource management that this was um, this was in relation to Nepal, but you're talking about different aspects of how we can actually I suppose in some respects get the best of all worlds. You know, we conserve water, we look at, 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 at reducing um, demand. We use technology as it's as required rather than going, you know, dis discreetly or separately, just completely off grid. Um, but also the context and the local is important as well to integrate those and come up with new uh, transdisciplinary integrative learning, particularly from communities and engaging with communities. And that's a challenge for engineers and for engineering. So that's it really, it's just some, some reflections on where, where we were and where we've come to and where I am, I suppose, in terms of my teaching and, and, and working with, with students. So I will leave it at that, if that's okay. And I'm sorry for going a little bit over time. Hi, Andy, thank you. And uh, you said that you are not a philosopher, but I think your presentation just uh, con contradicted you. 
and uh, your head with philosophical approach to the topic. We are uh, five minutes over time, but I also want to give a chance to those who want to ask a question or make a comment to do so. And I want to thank for both of you who are still here and uh, apologies if uh, this um, interferes with your agenda. Any any final question or comment? Well, I, I, I would like, I also have to run, but shall, I'll do it. I'd like to express my appreciation of that test because it really makes me think about um, also the polarization in the world and, and how you deal with that. So it's, it goes much, it, it really goes beyond just sustainability. Um, so it may also be like, whether I'm in an optimistic mood or pessimistic mood, which, which statement I choose, but um, it's, it's very good to think about that. Uh, so uh, thanks for sharing this uh, with us. Yeah, I think that that work from Anik is, is is very good. So it's good work coming from the Netherlands. Is um, is that uh, yeah. not the case? Yeah. Thank you, Nika. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Nelke, the two speakers who are still with us. It was such a great pleasure for me to find out more about the work that we've been doing, and it has been an educational experience, and I hope I can transpose something also into my own research or uh, teaching. And um, thank you also to both in the audience. I hope you enjoyed the session, and the video will be made available on the CEFI website. And we have a next event on the 10th of November on participatory tech assessment, so in a way it's a thread from from some of the aspects mentioned about the need to bring the community into engineering design and decision making. I wish you a beautiful day and um, be in touch. Uh, feel welcome to write, uh, write to us if you have news, events on engineering ethics, recent uh, research, and we will uh, uh, publicize this to our community of educators. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam.